Welcome to day five, lecture two. So we finished up talking about common traits of vessels and arteries, and now we're gonna move on and talk about capillaries and veins. Correspondingly then, you're gonna to wanna to have worksheet 5.2 out. So that's worksheet five for day five and two for lecture two. And our science means for today. See, I told you I can't skate. That's my defeatist son, Everett, learning how to skate. We also got over here from a professor on Canvas. It says, surprise dental surgery, no balloons, has left me still unable to drive and pretty darn high. Class is canceled. I moved the assignment due dates, or I meant to. That save button is very elusive. Anyhow, work on your tool assignments, have a glass of wine or whatever, enjoy the evening. You can call me if you have questions or just want a wacky stream of consciousness rant on why 2020 sucks so far. Well, we're out of 2020, but I still thought that was kind of relevant. And then finally, over here on the right, we got, are you taking me to the hospital? No, sir, you need top medical experts. We're taking you to the comments section. We'll begin today by taking a look at the characteristics of capillaries and specifically going to look at the differences in permeability between them. So we'll differentiate between the three types and where they are found and then how that relates to their function in the body. The capillaries are the smallest blood vessels within the human body. And they're what connect the arterioles, the smallest of the artery types, to the venules, the smallest of the veins. And the capillaries are found in between here. Um, the average length is about one millimeter and they have a diameter, very small, about the width of a red blood cell or an erythrocyte. And because they're so narrow, the red blood cells have to move in single file throughout them, a term that we call ROLU. There are about 10 billion capillaries on average within the body. Here we can see really well the, the ROLU, those red blood cells moving in single file throughout those capillary vessels. And recall back to the last lecture that the wall of the capillary consists of a single endothelial layer sitting on a basement membrane. And that thin wall and the small diameter of these vessels, these are optimal for exchange between the blood and the tissue fluid. Here we can see that ROLU in action with this GIF. The capillaries, so we said that they're thin walled, they have that single uh, squamous cell simple endothelium layer, right? So one layer of those flattened squamous cells, and they have a very small radius, the width of one red blood cell. So we see that this is ideal for maximizing the surface area and exchange of materials. So all the blood is exposed basically to the surface of that vessel, the vessel that maximizes the surface area, and we see that the velocity of the blood through those capillaries is also very slow, and that allows for adequate exchange time to occur. You can imagine if we're blowing through that capillary, then we don't get adequate time to exchange. But if we're moving slowly through that capillary, we do have that um, times to exchange the materials. So they branch to bring blood within reach of every cell of the body, these capillaries. And we see that there's two types of passive exchange. We see that there's diffusion, um, solutes moving down their concentration gradients. So fluids, gases, nutrients, and wastes. And then the other type we see is bulk flow. And this is the movement of water and solutes both together um, due to an existing pressure gradient. And that'll be a future lecture. And as a brief FYI, you should remember that the exchange between the blood and the tissue cells is not direct. There's this intermediary, which is the ISF, the interstitial fluid. So the cells exchange the materials with that interstitial fluid um, before they can move into the tissue cells. But those capillaries are so porous, the ISF is nearly the same composition. So in many terms, we just kind of disregard the ISF when we're talking about these, but we need to remember that that is a intermediary step. There are three types of capillaries, and we differentiate between them based upon their degree of permeability. And those are the continuous capillaries, the fenestrated capillaries, and the sinusoidal capillaries. Just looking at these, which do you think is most permeable? All right, first up, we have the continuous capillaries. Uh, these are the most common type of capillary, 
And as their name alludes, they are continuous in that they form a continuous endothelial lining. There are not fenestrations or gaps, uh, sinuses. So we see that there are tight junctions between these simple squamous epithelium cells, but they don't form a complete cell. They're small little clefts, and we call these intercellular clefts, so between cell clefts. These are just gaps between those endothelial cells of the capillary wall. And it allows things, smaller molecules like glucose, to pass through that wall, which is ideal, but larger particles like cells or proteins, they cannot pass through that cell wall. Here we have another look at a continuous capillary. And while they are the most common, they're the least permeable. Okay. Um, but we do have these intercellular clefts, so these gaps between the endothelial cells. And they allow things to move by diffusion or bulk flow, which we'll talk about shortly. But then we can also move materials through the cells, and that's going to involve membrane transport. So this could be something like penocytosis. And we did talk about types of endocytosis uh, last semester. P penocytosis was a specific type of endocytosis. Uh, penocytosis meaning cellular drinking. And this is where we internalize droplets of ECF that contain different fluids. So we actually kind of invaginate that membrane and form a vesicle to get the materials that we need. While the continuous capillaries are the most common, um, specific examples you could know would be they're found within the muscle, the skin, the lungs, as well as the central nervous system. Next up, we have the fenestrated capillaries. So uh, these also have a complete continuous lining of endothelial cells. However, they have little pockets or regions in which those endothelial cells are extremely thin. And we call these fenestrations. So fenestra means window. Um, for crime junkie fans out there, if someone is defenestrated, it means they have been thrown out of a window to their death. So you can remember that way, <laughs> I suppose. And these fenestrations, they're going to allow the movement of smaller plasma proteins. So these fenestrated capillaries are more porous, or I should say permeable, than the continuous capillaries. So those Fenestrations increase permeability, and we see these fenestrated capillaries in special locations where fluid transport occurs. We get fluid transport between the blood and the interstitial tissue. Now, as a think-pair-share, I'd like to think about what are some places these capillaries would be found if they occur where large amounts of materials are filtered, released, or absorbed. So take a minute and think about that, and we will review. Well, if they're found in areas where a lot of fluid transport occurs, an example might be the small intestine, where we see that absorption for nutrients. Um, maybe we're talking about endocrine glands, where um, they facilitate the absorption of hormones. Maybe we're talking about the kidneys, um, in involved in the filtering of the blood. Or finally, maybe we're talking about the choroid plexus. And if you remember, the choroid plexus is where we get that secretion of the cerebrospinal fluid. Finally, we have the sinusoidal capillaries, or just the sinusoids. And these are also called discontinuous capillaries, and that's because they have an incomplete lining of the endothelial cells. And this is where we see large gaps or openings. And we either have a absent basement membrane, or it's incomplete. So you can imagine then that these are the most permeable. I asked you the question early on, which of these capillaries would be most permeable? Here they are, the sinusoids. With these sinusoids, we're lacking a lot of those tight junctions, so we're most permeable. Uh, sinusoids, sinus, meaning cavity or hole, if you remember that from our uh, lab terminology last semester. And these openings, they allow for transport of large substances, as you can imagine. So here we're talking about larger proteins or formed elements. And when I say formed elements, that just means cells or platelets. 
Because these sinusoids are involved in the transport of large substances like those plasma proteins or formed elements, we tend to find them in areas where we're transporting large proteins or cells. So for example, we see it within red, uh, I'm sorry, within red bone marrow where we see the entrance of formed elements. So that's those red blood cells, the platelets, and the lymphocytes. We see them within the liver and the spleen, which are involved in the removal of the old erythrocytes, the red blood cells from circulation. And then we also see them with some endocrine, like the anterior pituitary here, uh, with the movement of larger hormones into the blood. And as you can see, a typical common characteristic of these structures is that they have this red color for the um, structure that has these sinusoidal capillaries. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at capillary beds. We just finished looking at these capillaries individually, but that's not how capillaries work. Uh, about 10 to 100 capillaries can form what we call a capillary bed. So a capillary bed is groups of capillaries all functioning together. Now, it might be a good idea to take out your worksheet here. We'll fill in some of the terms as well as some descriptions of the different features of a capillary bed here. So to start off, um, this capillary bed is gonna be fed by a met arteriole. Meta meaning in between. Okay, so we have this met arteriole, and this is a branch of the arteriole. Remember the arteriole is the smallest um, of the arteries. Now the proximal part of the met arteriole is going to be encircled by these scattered smooth muscle cells. Okay, so we can see that here. So we have smooth muscle cells within the proximal, proximal being closer to this artery here. Whereas the distal part, um, this is also called the thoroughfare channel. So this is, allows us to pass through this bed here. That is your thoroughfare channel and that has no smooth muscle cells within it. Now, the thoroughfare channel, that connects to a post-capillary venule. So remember, a venule is the smallest of the veins, allows us to return uh, blood to the heart. So that's gonna drain the capillary bed, this post-capillary venule. We also have true capillaries. Now, these true capillaries, they branch, branch from this thoroughfare or this uh, met arteriole, and they make up the bulk of this capillary bed. Okay, so we can see here the bulk of this capillary bed is actually made up of these true capillaries, not the met arteriole or this thoroughfare. Now, at the origin of each of these true capillaries, we'll see here, I'll switch a color. Maybe I don't know what's going to show up best, maybe some yellow. We will see that there is a ring of smooth muscle, and this is called the pre-capillary sphincter. And that controls blood flow into the true capillaries. Okay. So when that sphincter is relaxed, it permits blood flow into the true capillaries like we see here. So relaxed, this true capillaries, these are open, and we get blood flow into these true capillaries from this thoroughfare channel. However, if we have contraction of these pre-capillary sphincters then, then the blood is gonna flow directly from the met arteriole and through the thoroughfare channel to the post-capillary venule. And it's not gonna enter these true capillaries and it's gonna bypass the majority of that capillary bed. Now, interestingly, these pre-capillary sphincters here, they go through cycles of contracting and relaxing and it's about five to 10 cycles per minute. And we call this vasomotion, the cycle of contraction and relaxation of these pre-capillary sphincters. And the exact physiological reasoning behind vasomotion is not known, though it's thought to aid um, blood flow through tissues by helping to reduce resistance. That's one of the hypotheses that's floating around out there. Now, I should also point out that at any given time, only about a quarter of the body's capillary beds are open. So if we're looking at this bed here, the other 75% of the capillary beds are all gonna have contracted pre-capillary sphincters so that we bypass here and move to this post-capillary venule and we don't have blood entering the capillary bed. Now, why is that? Well, let me put it into perspective for you. 
So it is about 25,000 miles to encircle the globe. But we have about 60,000 miles of capillary if we were to put them end to end. So that's two and a half times around the world. Now we can only have a quarter of our capillaries open at once because there's only about 250 mils of blood in the capillaries. That's about 5% of your total blood volume. And we just don't have enough blood to fill all the capillaries at once. And for that reason, they cycle. Moving on to veins now, we're going to look at the structure and function of the three different vein types, uh, what their companion vessels are, and then the systemic veins role as a blood reservoir within the body. So we've brought oxygenated blood to the tissues now via arteries to the capillary beds. We dropped off those nutrients, gases um, at the capillary beds, and now we got to return that deoxygenated blood to the heart. And this is going to occur via veins. And veins merge into larger and larger vessels as we return to the heart. So we're going to see an increase in the size of that vessel and therefore an increase in the lumen diameter. First up, we have the venules. And the venules are the smallest of the veins. So they have diameters ranging from 8 to 100 micrometers. 100 micrometers, for example, would be the thickness of a piece of paper. They are the companion vessels to the arterioles. So remember the arterioles were the smallest of the arteries, and now we're talking about the smallest of the veins, the venules. And remember companion vessels, they supply the same body region. So we can get the oxygenated blood there and then back. So we prevent pooling, that type of stuff. Now the smallest venules are the post-capillary venules. Remember, those are what drain the capillaries. And then the largest venules we see will have all three tunics. And these venules are going to then merge to form veins as we return to the heart. A venule would transition to a vein if it is greater than 100 micrometers. So that's that cutoff point. Less than 100 micrometers were a venule, greater were a true vein. Small and medium sized veins, you might be able to guess their companion vessels would be the muscular arteries, and those are those mid sized arteries. Um, the largest veins, they would travel along or be companion vessels with the elastic arteries, the largest of the arteries. Now most of these veins of these sizes, they're going to have valves. So let's talk about that. So the valves are made of that innermost tunic of our vessels, the tunica intima, and as well as with elastic and collagen fibers. So we can see here we have a normal functioning valve. Okay. Um, and this allows us to continuously move blood toward the heart. And it's a similar structure to the heart's semilunar valves, which you've just recently covered within the cardiac unit. So let me ask you then, as a think pair share, what would happen if you had a faulty vein valve? So think about that. Well, as you probably guessed or know from experience, this is going to allow the blood to flow backwards, right? And if blood flows backwards, well, then we can have issues with pooling. So the valves, their job there, a normally functioning valve is to prevent the blood from pooling in the limbs and ensure that the blood is continuously moving back toward the heart and not pooling systemically. Well, your mind might have naturally gone here already, but we're going to talk about varicose veins. So varicose veins are actually caused by weak or faulty valves within the veins. So you can imagine if these valves, if they're weak or damaged, then blood isn't going to only move back toward the heart and it can flow backward and then it can pull in that vein and that causes that vein to stretch or twist. So generally these um, don't have too many health concerns. It can cause a little bit of aching, but it's generally mostly cosmetic. You can do things to help. Um, in severe cases, they will do surgery. Or like my wife, she's on her feet all day as a nurse and she wears uh, compression socks to help with this. To finish up our vessel functional anatomy, I thought I'd put up this image here side by side that we started with. So this is just showing the comparison of those companion vessels again. So you can see the large veins, they're companion vessels with the elastic arteries. The small to medium sized veins, companions to the muscular arteries, and venules to arterioles.
Now, to finish up veins, I want to talk about their role as a reservoir for blood or storage. So first, let's look at the amount of blood within different body systems when we're at rest. So within the pulmonary circulation, we'll see about 18% of the body's blood. The heart, about 12%. And that means that there's about 70% of the blood within systemic circulation at a given time when we're resting. Now, if we break that 70% down, we'll see that there's 10% of that within the arteries, systemic arteries. We said that there was 5% within the capillaries, meaning that there is a 55% of uh, blood within our systemic veins. So why is that important? Well, the large amount of blood within our systemic veins allows them to function as a blood reservoir. So meaning that we can shift blood from these reservoirs, the veins, into circulation, doing things like vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Okay. So maybe we need more blood during physical exertion. In that case, we'll vasoconstrict, and then maybe we're resting, and we'll vasodilate when less blood is needed when we're resting. We'll finish up today by looking at the different ways we can use vessels to deliver and then remove blood from certain areas of the body. So these will be simple versus alternative pathways. And with the alternative pathways, we'll talk about um, the concept of anastomosis. The way that blood is delivered to an area can vary. And so we can contrast these as simple pathways versus alternative pathways. First up, we have a simple pathway. And as it sounds like, um, a simple pathway is fairly simple. So with a simple pathway, we have one major artery that delivers blood to a body organ or a region. So each arterial from that artery feeds into a capillary bed. And then that capillary bed is drained by a venule. And these venules then merge to one major vein. And then that blood is returned to the heart. A great example of a simple pathway would be the blood to and from the spleen. So a single splenic artery delivers oxygenated blood to the spleen. Okay, and then the exchange is made within the capillary bed here of the spleen. And then a single splenic vein right here drains that deoxygenated blood from the spleen. Let's talk about alternative pathways now. And alternative pathways are alternative in that they use various numbers of arteries, capillary beds, or veins to service a body region. Uh, so not the one to one to one ratio as with the simple pathway. It's not the one artery, the one capillary bed, and the one vein for return. Um, so a lot of these are going to use uh, what we call anastomosis. And that just means that's a fancy word for the joining of different blood vessels. So, for example, our first alternative pathway here is arterial anastomosis. And we see just that. We see that there are different arteries, right, that are coming together and joining to feed this capillary bed. And then there is one vein for um, venous return here. So we see two or more arteries converging to supply the same body region or organ. Um, some examples of this would be the superior and inferior epigastric arteries that supply the abdominal wall. Another alternative pathway then is venous anastomosis. So by that name, you can probably guess there's anastomosis occurring with the veins. Okay, so while we have, here's our uh, previous example, the arterial anastomosis, but now we have one artery here that feeds this capillary bed, but we have venous anastomosis where these veins are joining here. So we see two or more veins draining the same body region or organ. Okay? And the examples of this could be the uh, brachial and cephalic veins which drain the upper limbs. The last alternative pathway we'll discuss is the arteriovenosus anastomosis. Okay. Um, this is also called just a shunt. And what we see here is that we have a the vessels that are joining are going to be an artery to a vein. And we're going to completely bypass the capillary bed. So we have the artery here, 
that is shunting over to venous return over here. So we're transporting blood directly from the artery to the vein. Now, as a concluding thought for today, I would like you to think here about where you might see examples of arteriovenous anastomosis. That's a mouthful. So to give you a clue, um, there's examples of these in your fingers, your toes, and your palms in your ears. Now maybe you're walking to and from class these days and it's uh, winter, and that might be some type of clue. So what they are, these shunts, the arteriovenosis anastomosis, they're present in the fingers, toes, ears, and they allow those areas to be bypassed if you're becoming cold or hypothermic. Now, because we can bypass those tissues, uh, those areas are particularly vulnerable to frostbite. Okay? I'll have that crazy aunt or uncle on Facebook. Um, in my case, it's a mother-in-law. So.